What I'm going to attempt to do today is, uh, is tell you, well, okay, I go to no-till conferences, I talk about tillage, so I'm going to come to a controlled traffic farming conference and tell you not to worry about controlling traffic, okay? Is that a good way to start off? I'll really endear myself to the audience, won't I, okay? Um, I want to I want to talk briefly about this. This is some work out of Penn State University. It dates back a number of years. Uh, Diker, um, uh, basically uh, uh, an agronomist who worked in the area quite a bit. But the the takeaway message from a lot of his work um, that, that I want to share with you today that I get to remember two things, at least the way I view things: axle load, deep compaction. Okay, content pressure shallow compaction. There's a lot of people that make the mistake of uh, if I spread the load out over a big enough area, I don't have to worry about compaction. That isn't the way it works necessarily. And if nothing else today, if, if, if we have that understanding, um, that'll be pretty good. Um, Randall Reeder at Ohio State, who was our no-till guy for quite some time, Randall's still pretty active, but he had this uh, investigation on going on up in northwest Ohio. And these are axle of 10, 20, uh, 10 tons and 20 tons, okay? And, you know, I, I got Randall one day, and this has been going on for 10 years in the early 2000s. I said, hey, Randall, um, I think you need to change your axle loads. And he looked at me and he goes, what do you mean? He goes, this was, a, this was a study that a lot of people replicated around the world. And he goes, it was really important. And he goes, and it's yielding results. We need to continue this. And I said, yeah, but, but Randall, you're a little bit light on your axle loads. And he goes, what do you mean? latest calculation, we got farmers have 50 ton axle loads. I said, you're only looking at 10 and 20 ton axle loads. And, and this, uh, this data, I think, is pretty important because it shows a trend in some respects. I, don't, I think we want to be careful we don't extrapolate, but the other thing that becomes important is let's realize that gross vehicle weight is doing the damage today. Okay? And I think that's why you're all talking about controlled traffic farming is because of gross vehicle weights. Uh, if we project that on uh, think about what's happening in terms of yield loss when you get 50 ton axle loads. Um, the other thing I think became pretty important, and this was Reader's work with Hacken, Hackenson's son, um, started looking at the, the, the depth of influence of compaction. And again, they went back and looked at axle loads. The thing I want to get people thinking about here is that this is a pretty simple four point curve. We went ahead and fit a curve to it because, you know, engineers do that, okay? And I was extrapolating a bit, but think about how deep the effects of uh, compaction go in the soil, today, okay? And I'm going to come back and we're going to talk about that in a little bit, but just remember the curve, okay? Um, farmers in North America, anyways, they have this wealth of choices, okay? These, these choices are helping the situation, but they're also making the situation worse, okay? Um, in Ohio, this year, the second half of harvest was horrendous. That's the way I could describe it. It rained uh, for quite some time. The ground never froze up. It was just one of those perpetual states. Farmers would get up in the morning. They'd look out their window. It's raining again. There's no way that I'm going to get my corn and beans out of the field. And really, they would wait until into, uh, the December month until things froze up in some respects. On the other hand, there were those farmers <laughs> who were concerned about making payments and things like that. And what did they do? They went out, they went out into the fields and muddied it out. Okay? Tremendous amount of damage done this year. I also have a lot of sympathy for those farmers, especially for those that were farming um, lots of acres in some respects. Um, one of the things I will say about the fall harvest in the state of Ohio is it's going to sell a lot of combines with tracks on it for the 2019 cropping season. Okay? Farmers have a very short memory. I'm probably talking to a group of them right here, but that was one of the most recent years in some respects. And again, it was one of those aberrations, but again, I have a lot of sympathy for these people in terms of what was going on. Um, I don't know whether I'm going to convince you of this or not. We've been doing this now for about four or five years. We've been looking at pinch rows on planters. And pinch rows uh, on central fill planters are the rows of corn, the rows of soybeans, if you will, between the transport wheels and the central section of the planter, where the central fill unit is. We're seeing the reverse track of Okay, and I don't know whether anybody else has talked about that, but what we're actually seeing is when we run tracks on the planter, we actually see a yield increase over what the wing rows are. Okay? It's not a market increase. We continue to see this year after year. Okay, 
which tells me for some of those farmers that are tilling soils, kind of things are going on. Maybe they're getting a little bit too light and fluffy. The other thing is, are the closing wheels doing what they're supposed to in terms of making, ensuring these fall contact? We actually see yield loss from wheeled um, planters, but we see a slight increase, not statistically significant, but a slight increase when we're running tracks on planters. And again, it kind of goes back and, and confirms some of that to me that there's shallow compaction and there's also deep compaction. One might be kind of a good thing, the other one might be a really bad thing. Um, Technology on a grain cart. You know, I, I thought, gosh, you put scales on a grain cart, you connect them to the cloud is a wonderful thing. Um, you know what, off the field, you know what uh, grain winch truck. But the thing that struck me about it is, now I know how the grain cart is as I drive it over the field, okay? I think farmers, at least in North America, they begin buying bigger grain carts because they don't have many trucks on the road. Their mindset is, and I don't know if I agree with it, the 2,000 bushel grain cart, I can save on getting another tractor trailer. When they ought to be doing the exact opposite of that. What the 2,000 bushel grain cart becomes is an excellent compaction device, okay? You compact much more of the field because so much of the field gets trafficked with that. So we've been doing a lot of investigations. The, the thing I want to point out here is a lot of the grain in this field, the, does the laser point work or not? Oh, there it is. A lot of Came out of this field right here. Now, not very much of a controlled traffic farming situation, is it? Okay. On the other hand, it is an odd shaped field. And one of the things I continue to say is everything's all well and with controlled traffic farming until the farmhand comes off directly across the field. And it usually happens at the worst time of year with the worst possible food that you can put on the soil in some respects. And so, what I keep going back to saying is the majority of damage being done to farmland in the U.S. is probably done by the grain cart at harvest because in many cases, uh, or at least in some cases, probably in the field when they shouldn't be. Um, we collected a lot of data, and this is data that other people collect, uh, have collected, but we looked at yield reductions when you're using wheel grain carts, you're using track grain carts, and the point I want to make is the red is a wheel grain cart, and you'll notice about a 23% reduction subsequent year in terms of those wheel tracks. And by when you think about flotation tires, you think of IF tires, you think of VF tires, that's all well and good, but you can't avoid the warranty, okay? And so when you always, you have to back and look at this load infra, uh, inflation pressure. What we found is on the IF tire, we're just about the same pressure you're running on a radial tire. And so I thought to myself, did it really make any difference if we were running IF tires on these machines? But the point I want to make here is these were both track machines. And you'll notice there are people on the track 19% reduction, and over here about a 20% reduction. This is on a 1,300 bushel grain cart, which, by the way, Andrew, the guy working for me, he assures me you can get 1,400 bushels in a 1,300 bushel grain cart. Okay? Do any of you have a similar experience with that? Yeah. All right. So now I get to thinking to myself controlled traffic farming. I've got a four wheel drive tractor, a Steiger. Um, we got pretty good size tires on it, 720 millimeter wide tires on it, duels on it, and then I'm running the grain cart behind it. So there's the, what I'm trafficking in terms of a, a 12 row um, header pass with a with, with a combine in some respects. And, and so yes, I appreciate flipping tires, but the other thing I keep thinking is what am I doing? How deep am I going in the soil? And when I use that previous relationship. Right here, my compaction depth is about 41 inches. Okay, I'm over a meter deep into the soil. And my question becomes is, do we ever undo the damage that's being done in these soils? Now, maybe if I'm up in northern Canada or western Canada, and I get a six or seven foot frost depth, meter and a half, two meter deep frost line, maybe I do. But, but I know this is not occurring in Ohio. The damage that we're doing today essentially is going to be there for some time. Um, with the combine, again, I'm just looking at heavy axle loads. When do you do the most damage? I looked at the combine, and in this case, um, I think I did that right, 53 inches deep. Okay, not quite as bad as a grain cart, but again, still pretty significant in terms of the depth um, of influence. Here's one that uh, a lot of people don't think about. Um, we've been using yield monitor data a lot of times to try to substantiate whether or not we have compaction problems. 
And one of the issues here is um, with the width of the header, the nature of the yield monitor and filtering that goes on within the machine, we actually wipe out a lot of the compaction events in the field that we might otherwise see. So if we look at the yield map right here, we don't notice these diagonal passes in here, which is actually a compaction plot that we created with a grain cart, okay? On the other hand, we clearly see it in visible remote sensed imagery. This is, v, this is a corn crop of V12. And when you begin seeing those things, those uh, diagonal streaks in there V12, it tells you something serious is going on. What we're doing now is we're taking this remote sensed imagery and using it to redistribute the yield monitor data coming off the machine to generate this yield map over here, which is now a high resolution yield map. Now I can tell the farmers what the true cost of compaction was for that event in the previous cropping season, okay? What I'm going back to hopefully I make, oh, I started out and I was gonna say this, so I forgot to. I'm really curious about the size of equipment. And so I go to the machinery companies and I ask the engineers, why do you guys build such big tractors? Why do you build such big combines? Their response is because farmers buy them. <laughs> so I go ask farmers, I say, why do, you, why do you gentlemen and ladies, why do you buy such big machines? And their response is, well, the manufacturers build them, okay? <laughs> so we're in this infinite do loop in some respects, and there's only one thing I think that's gonna get us out of this infinite do loop. And that is if we get rid of the human on the machine, which is the whole premise and why I'm talking about much of what I'm talking about today. Um, here's another thing that makes life a little more complicated in thinking about the future, and spe specifically automation. Um, Andrew will just pull me. on the planter does not change with speed. Now think about that. The draft force doesn't change with speed. If it was tillage tool, it would be a quadratic relationship. But what it's saying is, and my whole point of showing you this, is I'm not telling farmers to plant at 18 miles an hour. Please don't do that, okay? It's a big safety problem. Um, by the way, I'm going to read that. to yield 203 bushel an acre on all of our trials, five miles an hour up to 17 miles an hour. No discernible difference in yield. Singulation suffered a little bit, emergent suffered a little bit, but not enough to affect the yield. So here's what I'm trying to get people to think about. If I want to cover more acres, instead of getting a wider machine, having a higher draft load, I go faster. Not 18 miles an hour, but certainly eight to 10 miles an hour is within, within reason. And that's the point I'm trying to make as we go towards automation. The other thing here is, if you look at big equipment, necessarily it's less efficient. What? Big equipment is less efficient. When I look at field efficiencies, this is out of Oklahoma State University, the other OSU. Notice that the field efficiency, and this is a moderate size planter, going from 15 foot wide planter to a 40 foot wide planter, but notice the field efficiency drops from 75% down to what, about 55%? Think about what happens with a 48-row planter in our case, okay? And what I keep thinking of is, thank you, how many bearings are on that, and what happens when one bearing fails? The entire machine's down in some respects. And so again, when I'm arguing for smaller machines, this is what I think the future is, okay? There's a proliferation of robots. Part of the reason why I wanted to come and talk to you, in part is, because I want to go visit that co company in the lower right, and I'll do that on Friday, okay? I think they got the right idea. That's Swarm Farm, okay? To kind of pull this all together and tell you where I think things are going and why it's going to be that way, <laughs> I think we're going to track widths on, on track machines. We won't have wheeled machines anymore. We're going to track widths of 500 millimeters, okay? 
think I did that right. Um, I think we're going to go to gross vehicle waste under 10,000 pounds, in this case, uh, 500 kilograms. And when I look at that compaction depth, okay, I get here about 33 centimeters in terms of the influence into the ground. I think that's what's going to drive the shift towards automation. We're going to go to smaller machines. They're going to be supervised, okay? And here's a summary slide about what I think things are going to happen. I said under uh, 10,000 pounds or 4,500 kilogram, three PSI contact pressure, 20 kilopascals. I think they're going to be 100 kilowatt. They're going to be slightly higher in power because some implements we will pull at higher speeds. We'll do some operations at higher speeds. Working width of 10 feet. By the way, I can move this anywhere in the quorum belt in 24 hours. Um, track machines and implements. Everything's going to be on tracks. Um, by the way, I think the, the, the green card of the future is a pro box. Okay, it's a pallet bin. Supervised autonomy via the internet. In other words, we're not going to take humans out of the loop, but rather <laughs> humans are still going to be in the loop, but they're going to be managing increasingly a greater number of machines. And here's this last one here that becomes very important is mechanical life and technical obsolescence have to coincide. That tractor needs to have a mechanical life of about six to seven cropping seasons. What I want to do is I want to get more use out of that machine during the year by operating it 24-7, okay? Um, I'll remind you of the Gartner hype curve. Has anybody seen this one? Yeah. This is where the farm press hypes a new technology. Everybody gets excited. Doesn't perform quite as well as it ha or should, okay? We fall into the trough of dissolution here. <laughs> anybody been there before with the technology? And then coming out of the trough of dissolution, it, dilution, it, people figure out how to start making money with it. And then, you, then people who adopt in here make money. If you adopt them, you're out. You do it to remain competitive. So with that, I'm going to end here. Thank you very much. Scott, um, great introduction and, and obviously touched on a lot of issues that are important in the uh, compaction context and the control traffic context and all that sort of thing. And I'm pretty stoked with the idea of 20 mile an hour planning. Um, so control traffic and this thing here called SAGS, small automated, uh, small autonomous agricultural ground vehicles, if you like, but I'm not going to say that all afternoon. Um, so robotics or both, I guess, is the direction I'm coming from here. Um, and so autonomous vehicles do offer a lot of promise. I mean, the one that Scott mentioned, or two that Scott mentioned at the end, is obviously taking the labour out of the equation and the reliability. So small, uh, more small machines give you some redundancy capacity. So if something breaks down, you're not up against the wall straight away. Incre there's mention of um, that thing. Anyway, uh, mention of minimising compaction, as Scott mentioned towards the end. And clearly, if we have lighter machines, that it's not rocket science that the compaction issue is reduced. But I think I want to ponder a few points as we go on here. What level of soil compaction is a problem, whatever a problem might be? And there's no definitive to that, it's soil dependent, it's environment dependent, and so on. How small does an autonomous vehicle need to be before <coughs> soil compaction is no longer a problem? What is the impact on capacity? And obviously you have more of these things to make your capacity up, but what's the individual um, item capacity? <coughs> Plus we need to think also about the benefits of CDF that go beyond compaction management. And I'm sure that many people in this room would realise there are quite a number of those. And so I guess the, the angle I'm coming from is why would we not integrate autonomous vehicles and control traffic and get 
the best of both worlds. So just a, a ponder for a moment on the origins of control traffic, uh, notwithstanding some early entrees in the 1800s, but more recent times, it was sort of the early 60s that controlled traffic started to get a bit of, a bit of headspace, I suppose. And basically, it was a research approach. It was a research tool so that people could study the impact or, or study crop growth outside of the impact of compaction. And that was at a time when wheel loads were around about one to two tonnes. <clears throat> so when we had that size of machinery, people were observing negative impacts on crop growth due to soil compaction. And I'll be the first to admit that tyre technology, track technology has changed a hell of a lot since the early 60s. So but as Scott mentioned, also you know, it's this whole issue of contact pressures and axle loads and that combination. So control traffic has many proven benefits from a soil management point of view. And so I guess when uh, Jeff and Dio and I particularly spoke about a presentation on the topic, we thought, well, it's quite reasonable to use properties of CTF managed soil as our benchmark as to how autonomous vehicles might perform. So we've done a little bit of soil compaction modelling. Modelling, everybody's got a problem with models, but, uh, but we've chosen harvest as the sort of scenario to look at. The reason being, it doesn't matter what industry you're in, generally speaking, harvest will have the heaviest machines, the highest material handling requirements, and the greatest time use needs. There are probably exceptions. <clears throat> so I should just sit down, sat down and looked at a whole raft of power weight capacity relationship in grain harvesters right across the range from small um, you know, Asian rice harvesters to the monster class eights and nines, what we have now. And um, I think Scott mentioned, and this is one advantage of course of, of Scott being an abstract before the event, <laughs> because I knew he was talking about a four and a half hour kilo machine and 20 kilopascals of ground pressure. So if you look at what we get from a small machine, that, that's the four and a half thousand kilo grain harvest now. And it has a big capacity of a cubic meter up with a couple of meters and an engine power of 40 kilowatts. Now, I'm not necessarily suggesting that an autonomous grain harvester would look like that. I think our, our capacity to work with technology is way better than just replicating a picture of something that's big. Um, but it just, I'm, I suppose I put that up to put it in perspective for people who are used to big machines, this sort of size machine we're talking about. So to do our soil compaction modeling, uh, I made a couple of assumptions here. We stuck the thing on four equal size tyres, we could stick it on tracks. Um, each tyre carries 1,100 kilos or thereabouts. Because I'm wondering if we're smart enough to develop new autonomous grain harvesting technology, we should be hard enough to get around this silly problem of 80% of the load on the front axle or 20% on the back. We should be able to redistribute the load a bit to account for that cantilevered cutting. And we've given it a maximum ground contact pressure of 20 kilopascals. So now for a good after lunch session, I'll glaze you over a few graphs. <coughs> Don't get too disturbed by it. Um, looking at bulk density, it's basically a measure of soil compaction. It's a measure of how compacted or otherwise your soil is. Depth to half a metre. I only got a couple of these, but that solid line is meant to represent the condition of the soil before the machine runs over it. And the dotted lines represent what happens after the machine runs over it. Basically, all you need to remember is that if the line goes from that direction to that direction, you've got soil compaction. Now, I'm not making a comment about how important or otherwise that soil compaction is. It might make stuff all difference to your crop. It's just reflecting the fact that if you put a load on it, you're going to increase the density of the soil. <clears throat> this grey band here is a, is a useful thing called critical bulk density. Now, critical bulk density doesn't have a specific figure. People around the world have looked at what is the critical bulk density. When at what point does the bulk density start to really critically limit crop growth? That is going to depend 
on the crop, the soil, the environment you're in, sorts of things. <clears throat> and I have seen numbers reported that range from about a bit over one to over 1.5, depending on countries. But by and large, a lot of those numbers for critical bulk density will fall between about 1.3 and 1.4 grams per cubic centimetre. <clears throat> so in this situation here, this soil, which we would call, I'm calling a conventional soil, it's a random traffic soil, grain growing type soil, sour clay loam or sandy loam. Most of it's sitting in or above the critical bulk density now before we even start. And then we dry it machine over it and it causes that sort of change. It causes a change of, you know, say five to seven percent, six to seven percent in porosity in production. So as bulk density goes up, porosity goes down. So you start to lose aeration and, and habitat and water holding capacity and those sorts of things. Once again, not making a comment about how important or otherwise that is, they're relatively small changes. <coughs> So now if we go to a soil that's been managed under controlled traffic, a good old black cracking clay, vertisol, under controlled traffic for about two years. So we've got a soil that's down below this critical bulk density range down to 30 centimetres. And one part of the machine in the model pushes it up into that range. <clears throat> and one by one pass, I mean it's two tyres, basically you know, one side of the machine over this sort of piece of soil, if you like. We go to a, another version of long-term controlled traffic, very long-term controlled traffic. It goes under this machine and we push the soil right way over the critical bulk density zone. And interestingly, this little difference between there and there is the rut depth caused by the 4,500 kilo machine. Looking at you know, 10, 30% reduction in porosity or thereabouts. Have done some similar work with cultivated uh, ferrosol soils in Tasmania, looking at in excess of 50% reduction in porosity. That's the model. Right? People will argue about models for weeks on end because you can always find a, a mistake in a model somewhere. But let's have a look at some field results. This is from a black vertisol again. Uh, Black crack and clay or uh, This is the one that was under controlled traffic for about two years. Here we're looking at plant available water capacity in the crop zone, no traffic in the traffic lane, a fair difference. And for whatever reason, this, this was an experimental site. It sat doing nothing for about three years except growing some weeds. And so we see the plant available water capacity has held on pretty well. The track started to recover a little bit, as you would expect in a cracking clay. One passage of a tractor with 1,400 kilos on the back tyre and an 80% reduction in um, plant available water capacity. So, you know, a, a different measure to bulk density, if you like, but just reflecting what damage can be caused on a soil that has had no traffic on it, even by light traffic. Um, what are the benefits of CTF? Motion resistance on soft soils. Um, you know, it sucks a fair bit of power, whether it be a CTF soil or, or the soil is soft for some other reason. A spatially fixed and repeatable environment, um, which is good for things like, what do you call these things? Um, dropping the weed seed in the tracks, uh, into row seeding, and I would have thought probably pretty good for robotics as well. More uniform soil conditions and improved productivity. Not to say that we can't achieve these things out of other soils. Am I on five, am I here? <clears throat> so, just having a look at a bit of logistic stuff, I pinched some data off some grain harvesters, a couple of pretty conventional harvesters, Tasmania, Queensland, quite different yields, quite different operating speeds, but both putting through about 30 tonne per hour instantaneous throughput capacity. Going back to that sort of machine we were looking at before, I'm concluding we need six to eight of them to match the capacity of one, which is no big deal. I mean, you know, with, with swarm robotics, I don't think six or eight machines is, is going to be, um, you know, unmanageable by any stretch of the imagination. Talking about an individual fill time of around eight to 12 minutes, 
But each one of those, or each swarm, if you like, each one will be, let me get this right, there will be an unload interval within the swarm of about 1.3 to 1.5 minutes. So every one and a half minutes, say, there has to be either a chase of in servicing the swarm or one machine leaves the swarm to go and unload, depending on what the circumstances. So really, the number of these little beasts we need is really dependent upon a few key factors. What size limit do we put on if we're going to build compaction management as part of the design criteria? What does yield and yield variability do? Because big machines, and I'm no, I'm no fan of big machines, I hate them, but you know, they do have their place. They offer quite a buffering capacity when yield is going up and down. Can we get the same sort of operating speeds out of small autonomous machines? And what is the impact of frequent unloading, whether it be serviced by a chase bin or whether it be um, you know, leaving the swarm to go and empty? Just as an example, those ta that table I showed before was the sort of median yield conditions. If we push that up to the top end, sort of 90 percent off type yield conditions, we're in for an unload frequency of about every 30 seconds out of the swarm. So that means you've got to really multiply the number of machines to bring to stretch out the unload period. So just a few points to finish off. Harvesting technology will continue to improve, I'm sure. Now, things haven't changed that much in the last century. We still take it in at the front. We thrash it. We store it somewhere. Chuck it, store it out the back, and on we go. So no matter what the improvements are, we're still going to have to have that process. And it doesn't matter if it's grain or potatoes or sugar cane or what it is, the, the steps are much the same. Tire and track technology will continue to improve. We've seen lots of changes in the last couple of decades in tire and track technology. Some things don't change, and the load, whatever the load is, doesn't matter if it's heavy or light or medium or what, it's got to be carried somewhere, and the somewhere is in the soil. So I suppose my question would be, why would we go down the pathway of super light machines and lots of them, when maybe what we could do is take medium weight machines and combine them with control traffic. We get the benefits of keeping our traffic in a set location. We get the benefits of labour reduction through automation. And we get the benefits of redundancy by having you know, not just one big sucker of a machine that breaks down and is stuffed. At least you can have three or four or five or whatever it is and so you maintain some level of, of flexibility there. So that's it. There's, there's always one. There's always one. <laughs> <laughs> and presumably that will our last speaker in this session is Professor Peter Cork from Queen's University of Technology. He's the director of the uh, ARC Centre for uh, Robotic Vision. He's got a long history of work in this area. And uh, when he's equipped with a microphone, he'll be speaking. Okay. Thanks very much for the invitation to be here. Uh, I'm not a farmer or an agronomist. I'm an electrical engineer. I've been doing robotics for 35 years. I've been up and down the Gartner high curve uh, on multiple technologies through my career. I want to address a, a question that, that Scott asked before, which is about why are machines getting bigger? And I suggest it's just down to productivity. If you've got the bigger machine that goes faster, you're going to cover more hectares in a day. You can get more done. Uh, it means you can have a shorter working day or you can have a bigger farm. So I, I think that's pretty much, unconsciously or not, you're driven by productivity and big machines are delivering it to you. Now, the sweet spot for productivity at the moment is to build the biggest possible machine you can and put the driver in there. 
And I think we've evolved into that particular sweet spot because we th keep thinking about having people driving machines. World's changing. We don't need to have people driving machines. So if you remove that constraint, then you can start to think about different ways of, uh, of tackling this problem. So I want to start with, uh, with a few sort of general, general marks. If you've got multiple paddocks uh, or multiple fields and you've got then robots doing their work, there's two ways you can cut it out. Right? You can have one robot per field working in parallel, or you can have multiple robots working in a coordinated fashion inside the one field. Right? Two different ways we can think about it. You can use both, both modalities at once. So you're slicing and dicing the work and assigning it to uh, multiple machines. Now, what would those machines do? Right? They could do sowing, they could do weed control, or they could do harvesting. And it was interesting to hear uh, John uh, talk previously about, about harvesting, because harvesting is something that I actually think, or I didn't have the imagination to think that robots could do. And I think sowing is difficult, because the smaller the machine, the less seed you can carry, the more often it's going to have to go away and up. And also, we need a lot of mechanical force to pull the seeding tool through the ground. And the smaller the machine, it's got less weight, it's got basically less traction force, unless you put big ugly tracks on it. Uh, so it's got a grip and it's got to do a lot of soil damage. So the particular uh, problem that I'm going to talk about is work on weed control. Uh, and the reason we chose it for a couple of reasons, right? Uh, it doesn't have to pull anything through the ground, so that's pretty easy. Uh, it's used multiple times per cropping season, so we get sort of the biggest bang from our budget by investing in this particular problem. The machines are going to be small, and I think that they'll probably move more slowly than the machines you have now. And once you do that, then I think you would get a number of alternative weed destruction technologies beyond spraying. And with the rise of nasty super weeds, right, I think you're going to have to look at other technologies, whether it's thermal, microwave, selective mechanical uh, disruption of the weeds. I think be done more easily from a smaller platform. So this is uh, sort of another reality check. The uh, machine, I'm just going to just put some numbers up there on its width, its speed, and some of the cons, and they've all been talked about today. I'd be very concerned to even say that a small robot is only five meters wide, goes quite slowly, but it tracks lightly on the earth, uh, can maybe go 24 by 7, and there's no labor involved. So you do that, there's a factor of a sixth and a factor of a, a quarter. So it may, my, my, this machine now is a 24th, the productivity of the big machine that you're used to. 4%, right, what the little machine would do. Now, with some work, we could probably make it faster, and maybe we can make it a bit wider, but we don't want to go down the same route that you went with every big machine, right? So we're going to say, okay, the machine is, does one 24th of the work, so you're going to have at least 24 machines. We used to have one machine. But that's got the redundancy advantage because if one machine breaks and you've only got one machine, you're screwed. If you've got 24 machines and one breaks, you've got 23 left. Uh, so you've got a lot of redundancy. You can probably take them out when the ground is wet and soft, which you can't do with your very, very big machine. The other thing you've got to do, if I'm trying to convince you to buy 24 machines when you buy one machine, the machines have got to be at least 124th of the cost of your big machine. So you've got to think differently about the way you build a machine. Reality check number three. World changing. Electrification is happening. And you've probably heard about what's happening with electric vehicles, with autonomous vehicles. It's going to become commodity technology, right? Uh, with your matrix, they're getting better and better and getting cheaper and cheaper. Uh, electric hub motors like this are coming out of China for stupidly low because they're powering electric vehicles that China needs to mobilize. So they're in like small electric scooters, uh, small electric cars. It's commodity tech. They cost almost nothing. You should be thinking about that. And solar panels are a way of generating electricity uh, essentially for free in this country. So if you put them on the well, put them on charging stations at the visit. And the other thing is computers uh, just continue to get better and better, and they will continue to do that for a long time to come. And it's coming robotic technology is coming. So you've got all of these technologies allowing you to reimagine the sort of machines that we use uh, in agriculture. So to 
2010, a guy called Andrew Bates came to visit me in my room. Uh, Andrew's uh, the founder of Spawn Farms, so I knew Andrew before he was Spawn Farms. And we got uh, a federal government linkage grant to look at autonomy. So Andrew had the vision of lots of small modular machines, uh, and he was hanging on about the book. Actually, before I'd even heard of that term, and he said, could you build a small robot? He said, yeah, we could. So this is the prototype that we developed out of that first grant. So it's a small John Deere electric vehicle with a small spray boom. Uh, and what we, what we as academic partners in this were considering was how do we get the cost down? The, the expensive RTK GPS NAS system out of it. Uh, and you know, look at other, other means of, of guidance. So the way this thing is guided is using cameras and computers, low cost GPS, uh, and we do a lot of really clever stuff that some of the students working on the project figured out, but they can do few centimeter precision tracking of existing crop. You know, it's different to the GPS principle because the thing doesn't know where it is, it's just maintaining its relative position with respect to the crop that's already there, right? It doesn't know where it is, but it knows where it is with respect to the previous crop. So you've got to, you can think about it in a different sort of way, but we can do very, very uh, row following across a very wide variety of different of crops on different soils uh, and at different stages in the life cycle of the crop. So that was kind of the thing that we developed here. And because it's basically relying on real low cost sensors, commodity computers, cameras, GPS, etc. And um, some of the plots we did was uh, their track of the robot overlaid on the plot of the farm. We also did collision detection uh, and avoidance. This is Dave, the guy who led the team, uh, very confident in his work. Uh, this is using essentially stereo cameras on the front of the vehicle and a very, very robust uh, obstacle detection system that we came up with. So maybe it could deal with fallen trees, power poles, which Andrew had in the property, uh, kangaroos, uh, random people who might be there. We then evolved the technology. So this is some work that we did uh, independently, uh, funding from the Queensland government. So this is what we call Agbot 2, uh, and it's uh, got a number of cameras which look down so it's camera view, and on this side's the annotated camera view. So it's quite easy using AI technology to look, recognize individual plants, and then classify them. And once we know what the plant is, then we can then take the appropriate action against that particular plant. Uh, so in a moment, uh, you'll see uh, that's, that's the robot from the back. So we can do uh, controlled spraying, so we can apply you know, a fraction of the amount of, of herbicide you need if you were doing an open slot. Uh, and you can see some of the targeted deposition. And here's the mechanical weeding way. And it's going kind of crazy here, more crazy than it needs to do. The idea is that you just chip out the individual weeds uh, rather than uh, do sort of wholesale uh, surface soil uh, uh, in, in intervention. And then we can do any mixture you like of herbicide and mechanical. So maybe you've got, uh, maybe you use this for the, the herbicide for easy weeds and you use the, the chipper for uh, more, more resistant weed species. Uh, this is some, some work we did at Redlands in Brisbane, a uh, test farm. And what we did is we had some rows which were not, not tended by a robot and some rows that were, so that's the, that's the pattern. And we just watched it grow over a period of a couple of months. Uh, watch where the weeds were. What the image that you see here is actually a photo mosaic put together from the imagery that comes from the robot. It builds a big, uh, like, it's like a way you do with aerial pictures. And over time, you can see weeds sprouting in some of the rows uh, where there were no robots from the weeds. Uh, and that's the sort of average number of weeds in those uh, different types of rows. Uh, and that's again one of those, one of those photo mosaics. It's pretty high resolution imagery actually, so after the robot's been out of the field, you can just basically scroll around the whole thing, uh, zoom in and see what's, see what's there. So we can get really good statistics out of this robot. The next thing, uh, if you've got modular robots, is that they, they, they're smaller, they've got less capacity, uh, and particularly for weeding, we need to refill it. So we did quite a bit of work on this because modular robots make no sense unless they can look after themselves autonomously. So here's the robot, and it's, the robot's house is a standard 40-foot shipping container. 
Uh, so it's able to autonomously dock with its shipping container. Uh, so it's figuring out where it is with respect to the container. Uh, it will take itself in. It will take itself in. There are solar arrays uh, on, the, on the roof uh, and a large battery. So it will take itself in and it will <laughs> essentially plug itself in. So it will recharge. Uh, and we're using uh, only connection. So just basically uh, two copper pads together and it will uh, begin recharging. And then we also do automated refilling uh, of, the, of the tank. So that's basically, for this particular case, uh, that's really all that needs to be all that needs to be done. And when it's full, it will just go back out into the field and keep on working. Uh, if we look at non-chemical weed intervention, so we're looking at microwaves, we're looking at the mechanical, uh, light mechanical tillage, then we don't need to tank it up at all. All we need to do is, is fill, fill it with electricity and use electricity to do uh, the weed destruction as well. So take a message. Might sound a little radical. It's just CTF at a smaller scale, right? And without the driver. And the driver doesn't make any sense. Uh, you got GPS to guide the machine. Why have a person to watch the GPS? Uh, the thing is important to be aware of mega trends in technology. Electrification is a massive mega trend in the world as we try to decarbonize a lot of our economy. So massive amount of investment going into electric technology. You should jump on that. Right? Someone else is doing all the hard work of building the tech. Uh, you just need to repurpose it for, for your needs. Uh, AI is going gangbusters, so is robotics. And I think you can, pro if you consider you've got a different set of capabilities available to you through technology, don't just take the machines that the vendors are offering to you. Think about what are the machines that you really want uh, and yeah, demand that demand that they be built. Uh, rethink the way you do the farming. Thank you.